Hello, welcome to another episode of the Leia Licensing and Games podcast. I'm Mitch. I am now beardless um, as of yesterday. Um, so joined today by uh, my CEO, uh, our co-founder at Leia, Ratchet. Welcome, Ratchet. Good to be here. Um, nice to nice to see you freshening up. Um, hopefully you're, you're feeling nice and uh, light and uh and uh, cool. Um, I'm guessing it was due to being in Australia. You just had to kind of get rid of the heat uh, that, that that's trapped in that beard. No, it's not, it's actually really cold here, and um, I actually feel like super naked without the beard. Um, yeah, I, I feel I feel strange. Um, but anyway, I digress. Um, today we're we're very pleased to be speaking with Nuno Menezes, great pronunciation, and Barbara uh-huh. Borges. <laughs> from uh, the Portuguese football club, FC Porto. Um, Nuno manages licensing of the FC Porto brand across multiple categories. uh, And Barbara is in uh, Porto's marketing team. So um, really excited to uh, learn more about what they're doing in the space. Um, They're one of the more active football clubs in in games and interactive globally. So really excited to learn more about what FC Porto is doing. And and we'll also be looking at the collaboration they did in the Metaverse game Upland last year. So welcome, Nuno and Barbara. Thank you. Cool to be here. Hi, thank you for having us. So first first of all, I I wanted to start by just sort of talking about um, Porto and and, um, the the deal you did with Upland, which is super exciting. Um, I think you're probably one of the more forward-thinking, um, kind of innovative, innovative clubs when it comes to licensing in games um, and interactive. So you were the first European football club, I think, to enter the metaverse through the partnership with Upland. So can you just tell us a little bit about yeah. that and, and what you're doing with Upland exactly? Yeah. So uh, yeah, thank you for 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 your compliment as well. Uh, uh, it all started uh, in brand licensing Europe. So it's an event in London where people can meet up and create some network, and then it all evolved naturally. So uh, after just just a, one month after the the, we, we met Upland at the Brand License in Europe. We released our fund token with, uh, with Binance as well. So we had a little bit of experience on uh, fun engagements and on that kind of field. Um, and then uh, I think, I think our, our ecosystem, it's, it, it's naturally uh, attracted to those things because although we have 130 years old almost uh, we're a young team so we're both under 35 <laughs> uh, i won't mention barbara's age uh, you don't look at, you don't look at, you don't look a day over 25 either of you <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so we're always hungry for being updated and and I don't know pursuing these kind of of projects. And uh, one of the most important things uh, that we're doing with these projects and other projects, it's it's the education thing. You know, uh, if if you go on the street right now and if you ask. Uh, people about metaverse or about web3 there's still a, a lot of misconceptions so it's important at these first steps to work a lot in terms of education to work a lot uh, in terms of the concept so uh, what is web3 what, what is an nft it's still a thing that people want to to ask us uh, so I think that's I think that's it. Yeah, yeah, I think essentially educating is a challenge that you have if you're a pioneer in something, especially such a world like web three, where it's so different, everything, you know, it all it all happens and evolves online and not many fans are used to that because everything in our world is very physical. From either having the tickets to going to the match and being physically there. So Part of our challenge and part of always chasing innovation is educating and the educational content. It's saying 
this is what it is. We're in this because of you, because it is essentially mm -hmm. with every partnership. It's always about the fans mm -hmm. and bringing them closer to the club. So it's also important to us to make sure that they know what it is and they're able to use it and enjoy it. So it's not like, okay, we've signed this partnership. This is what we're doing. We're the first. Yay. Great. It's also, this is for you. You can use it, explore, learn more about it. We're just essentially also a tool that facilitates in them, you know, getting to know this new and evolving world. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I think that that makes a ton of sense. And just, just for um, everyone listening, like what exactly have you done in Upland? It was the like FC Porto, like the stadium and like, what, what is the experience yeah. exactly? So being, being the first European club, there wasn't a city built yet. So that's that was our start, our starting point. So we needed to get the city. Um, you know, Upland is an American company. Yes, they can go on Google and look at the maps, but they really wanted to know. Okay, so this is put to the city. What about the region? What should in, what should we include? What until what point do you think it's it'll become a different region and so on? So those were our first starting steps. We opened up the city. Then we decided to build um, the stadium. And after the stadium, we did the FC Porto tour. Because, you know, like, like Nunu said, it's 130 years of, of history, almost, this September. Um, and over time, we've had either different campuses, different training grounds. Um, you know, so it's, we also did that tour to promote and show our history over time and how we've evolved from a small office, a small pitch to what it is today. Yeah, and one one of the things that we we worked a lot, it's uh, these kind of platforms doesn't limit themselves in the digital world. So we needed to create experiences outside the digital world. So we invited fans to come over to have experiences in stadium to uh, meet and greets or vip tickets or other kinds of assets and things that money can't buy so this is the true asset for an nft project it is those kinds of experience that that a fan can't have acted mm -hmm. uh, somewhere else yeah and i think upland got that really well. They were present in two matches, two of our biggest matches in the season against our two biggest rivals. Before every match we have, well, in the US, it's the concept of tailgating. Here we call it our fun zone. So we have different experiences. We have food, we have drinks, we have a lot of things going on outside of the stadium. And Upland knew that they understood really well that they needed to be physically present for then fans to trust them online. So mm -hmm. they were here, they had two activations, which was the 360 activations where fans got to make videos, take pictures. They had giveaways, they gave away tickets because essentially it's just like he said, yes, it's all online, but for you to get that trust and to really get the value in that, it's, you know, football, soccer, mm -hmm. whatever you, you want to call it. It's, it's still very physical and that built a bridge. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, Instead of, uh, you know, barbecue and, and the American tailgates, you just had Bafana and soup. Was that the, the Portuguese style tailgate? The fans are definitely present. Soup is very present, but we also have <laughs> beer and other drinks and games. Awesome. And, and what, how was the game against Sporting? Did Sporting win or did Porto win? Sporting's the team that I've adopted, by the way, so... <laughs> really? Yeah. We should have known that before coming that. on. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch, Mitch doesn't understand a thing of, of, of sports, so he's just into the colors, I believe. Uh, the, beginner's <laughs> true, mistake. True. But yeah, the, that can't be an excuse because blue is better than green. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Um, I, I was going to ask, you know, like, how did you, you, you pick Upland, but you kind of went, went through it there, you know, it made sense for your fans and, you know, they, they really understood and wanted to work with, with Porto and, and, and the club. I guess the high level question I'm interested in is last year and, and you know, through the, through the rise of Web3 and the metaverse, a lot, of, a lot of licensors and a lot of kind of the easy opportunities were to do an NFT drop, something much smaller, I guess, much more straightforward. 
Um, what led you down that path of kind of like, actually, we want, we want to do something big and it's going to take a lot of effort. You know, we'll have to figure this out. You know, there's complexity there. What what initially made you get into this space or like yeah, make that decision of like, actually, you know, we want to we want to build something big here and, and see how that goes. We understood early on that this was a new world that was here to stay. And, you know, it, obviously we knew it was going to be a challenge and we knew we didn't have comparison. Mm. We had small things that other clubs were doing, but not as deep as we were. So it was almost like, all right, let's, let's see how this goes. Let's trust our instincts. Let's learn a lot more about it. Um, and, and kind of make our decisions based based on that. We understood from our experience with Binance mm -hmm. that things were evolving and it was a very fast evolving world. And so we felt very comfortable. Our experience with Binance was very positive and we thought, why stop here? You know, we, there's interest in this. We see interest from our fans, even if it is just the educational part of what is it? Explain to me what's going on. What are you doing? What are you achieving? And how can I either benefit or participate from that? And so we really, we, we felt comfortable in a way that let's try it. Let's try it. It's, it's very, in our DNA, you know, we're, we're challengers. We like to do things first and we like to do them well. So it was, you know, at first you're walking on eggshells and then eventually you take off the training wheels and then we're like, yeah, let's, Whatever it is, we'll learn more about it. We'll um, provide new experiences, and it just will innovate. It's fresh air. Yeah, and in, and in terms of licensing and partnerships, uh, it's important to trust your partners, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we know what what's our, what is our field of expertise, which is playing football, which is even marketing activations. Uh, and we wanted also to outreach, mm -hmm. to, to be where our funds are going. Because it's, as Barbara mentioned earlier, it's, it's all about this. It's all about bringing the fans closer to the, to the club and the club closer to the fans. So we need to be where our mm -hmm. fans are. And we have our, our fan base, it's, it's really diverse. So we have a lot of young people and we ourselves are enthusiasts of, of the, these things. So for us, it's, it's, the complexity didn't scare us, mm -hmm. but it, it, it created butterflies in our, in mm -hmm. our stomachs, you know? Mm -hmm. We were like, let's do this. We were really excited. That's, that's, that's exciting to hear. And I, I think it's, um, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned trust and, and relying on the partner to know what they do best. I guess just quickly, like what was that ideation and creative process? Like, you, you know, you've obviously we've seen the output of kind of the stadium and the city and all of that, but was, was that you asking Upland, you know, what do you want to do here and what will work best for your, your players? Or did you lead with, I think we should build this or like, or was it just a mix of both? Um, I think honestly, it was a mix of both. Mm -hmm. It was a mix of both. It was us telling them, how do we proceed? What are our next steps? What do you need from us? What can we do? Mm -hmm. And it was them saying, okay, this is the next step, the usual next step. Does it make sense mm -hmm. to you? Does it apply to you? And I think we've just evolved from that. Like, like I said, it, we started building the city. And that was them telling us, this is the first step. We have to build the city. Right. How far can we go? Mm -hmm. And then it was then us telling them, okay, trust us. We're here. We, you know, we live here. We know how this is. So go up until this point. And then we'd say, what is the next step? And then they would say, okay, let's build the stadium. And then we'd say, okay, here's everything that you need for building. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it was very mutual. It was very they know the best about what they do and we know the best about what we do. So I think the process was very 50, 50 in terms of what do you need from us? And they tell us and then vice versa. Yeah. And it was really intense because, uh, it was very the, fast. Yeah. In the beginning we were meeting uh, every week 
and and also with with WhatsApp, we were, we were yeah. always communicating. And and well, a, a big shout out here to Barbara because because he was she was really really important in this process in making things happen. So I think it was it was really great to have that ecosystem created, and we were speaking the same language. You know, we were all into the same. Uh, projects, although sometimes uh, in these uh, uh, projects the goals may be different because, well, our main goals were uh, diversification of our assets, were, were the outreach, was to try to be where our fans are, and then Upland had their goals as well to add another city, to get into Europe, and well, it, it, it but it all complemented. Which was big too. It was yeah. big for them to contact us and, you mm -hmm. know, do you want to be your entryway or gate to Europe? Mm -hmm. That was, yeah. you know, from, from a partner that achieved so much and is so present in metaverse and everything they've done. It was, it was big for us to receive that and, and have that opportunity from them. Yeah, sure. Sound, sounds really healthy. I think, you know, it's, it's that level of trust of they have, you know, Upland has this mechanic of cities. It's a real world simulation almost. You need those kind of core elements. And off the back of that, you're then able to influence that with what works for your fans and, and your audience. So um, I guess now that it's kind of out there and uh, it, it's happened, like, are you able to talk about like what the results have been or any high level kind of learnings, you know, in terms of output? That, that's interesting because at first they used to send us all these reports and our first questions was, is this good? Is this bad? We have nothing to compare. We've never done this before. Is this, are these numbers, should we cry about it? Should we laugh and celebrate? And they're like, no, these are really awesome. These were really good. Because, you know, for us, five or 5,000, we have nothing to compare it to. I think that's part of it, you know, being the first to do it, you're kind of setting, you're setting the standards and you're mm -hmm. setting the bar on things. And so we, another, again, we have to trust them and they're like, no, this is doing well. These are good numbers, especially coming from a club that has never done this before, has no experience. These are good. So yeah. I think overall we were a little bit more relaxed and it was, it's also motivational for it to keep going and keep doing other things. Yeah, and the, the results are so good that we are on a podcast speaking about <laughs> it. So, yeah. That's the, that's the ultimate uh, positive sign of, of any licensing <laughs> collaboration. Does it, does it turn into a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> right. Fantastic. Which, is, which is being broadcast live to 100,000 people. <laughs> I'm like, enough. Bye. <laughs> um, cool. I, I wanted to shift gears a little bit um stop talking about the the metaverse um we'll talk about it a little bit but um more so about like the landscape for sporting teams in um games and in interactive i think um you know when i first started working at layer i kind of looked at the space and me as someone who played like you know fifa and and um you know pez i kind of just looked at it as like those were sports games, right? There wasn't really any more room, but I guess as you look more into it, um, you know, the, the space is really fragmented quite substantially um, over the last 10 years, you know, things like mobile gaming and, and web three, like we just spoke about. Um, and even in the case of, of football, more specifically, now you have um, FIFA, the, the EA franchise, which is coming to an end. So it seems like there's a lot more opportunities for, sporting teams for athletes um to kind of extend the reach of their brand in games right now is that something that you agree with yeah sure so it's 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 like everything else in in society let's 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 even think about what we are doing here uh 30 years ago, this wouldn't be possible. We needed to be on a radio station with all these technologies. So we just have one option to make it. Now we have multiple options. We could be uh, at our phones. We could be, we're in, in three different countries making this happening. So yes, the fragmentation, I think it's good because it creates more opportunities. It creates more assets, more platforms, more spaces for 
concepts to evolve and for people to be in. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in terms of partnerships for the club, as long as they make sense for the club, then you have endless opportunities. And it's a perfect gateway for you to get to more people. What we've seen through this whole Web3 experience is that you're able to reach a lot of other people. Before, we didn't have the concept that we had a lot of fans in Turkey, for example. Mm, and Web3 okay. taught us that. You know, Web3 taught us that. And so through these partnerships, you're getting to a lot more people, a lot more fans, and you're, you know, putting putting your club out there and showing them everything you've, you've achieved and, and showcasing your history. So I think regardless whether it be a mobile game, whether it be EA Sports, whether it be whatever, it's it opened up a lot and I think it's evolving quite fast. That's that's super interesting. So those fans in Turkey, were they like were they already fans and you just kind of reached them through this project with Upland? Or um, are they are they new fans now that you've reached as a result of doing the partnership in Web3? What we noticed was they were fans, they knew about the club and had a positive image about the club, right. which is a small seed that you need that once you have the correct partnership, once you get to the right places, it's just that click that we're like, okay, I knew about them. They were good. I like them. And now they're doing this. This is interesting. And so subconsciously, you're creating that loyalty already to perhaps other clubs within the same country that um, that do not have these partnerships, you know, because they already have that, we noticed they have that positive inkling and now you just did this partnership that also interests them, that's added points. So in their mind, subconsciously, they're already, their focus is on you. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. the, and if you think about this, we're a, we're a, a team that it's almost always a Champions League. So we're always exposed to different countries. Mm -hmm. And if you think about players, we had some players that played here and then went there. So it's easy because we, we always have great players. So it's easy for them to have a positive uh, thought about us. So, yeah. No, it makes, Wave your makes flag high. It, <laughs> it makes, it, makes a ton of sense. Look, I mean, you can't argue with, like, you, thank you, Jose Mourinho, all those years ago for the, yeah. the, the Port, sure. Porto brand. Yeah. Um, but but be, beyond just Web3 and kind of fan experiences, like, how, how are you thinking about the space of gaming more broadly? Like, are you looking for more opportunities in mobile gaming, for example? Like, what's your kind of, over, like, what's your outlook on, on the space? I think it's, as, as Barbara mentioned, as long as it makes sense to us, as long as it respects our identity, we have some, we have some boundaries that we, we like. We have our identity. It, it's not boundaries. Yeah, it's the wrong word. But we know who we are and we know who we're not. So, yeah, we're always looking for new opportunities because as we're a young team, we're always, we, mm -hmm. we want to be everywhere. But, but we know the, the club's voice, we know our philosophy, we know that, that there are some fields that make more sense for us and fits better with our, with our mm -hmm. identity than others. Yes, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And also with our credibility, we don't want, it's not like we want to be everywhere doing everything. <clears throat> if we do it, even it, it could be small, but it could be good. And as long as it makes sense, because then either our credibility and our other partners' credibility, it's like, okay, well, they're everywhere. Either good or bad, they're there. That's not us. We want to do it. We want to do it well. And we want to be a little bit, you know, present and ever so that we can get to – our fans are all different, with different tastes, with different – you have the guy who comes to the games in a suit. You have the the lady that's all tatted up, up and down. You know, you have – so I think it's – it's important for us to have a little bit of mm. what everybody likes, but it's important for us to do it well, and it has to make sense because other yeah. than that, we don't we don't want to saturate anything or anyone. Yeah, and and it's also important the the scale of the the project because sometimes it's important to to evaluate. There are some partnerships that are at the beginning, so we need to grow with the partner we need to believe in the project so smaller projects don't 
uh, uh, scare us, but but they they have they have to make sense, you know. It needs to respect uh, the way we think, the way we breathe, and it needs to respect the connection that we have with our fans. That's the ultimate thing. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really good way to approach the space. Is like always be open to the opportunity, but you know, make sure that you stay true to 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 your brand yeah. and your values mm-hmm. and and your identity. Um, what what like if you look at the space of games and interactive and and sports clubs, you know, maybe not maybe not just football, but across all sports. Like, what are some of the opportunities that you see emerging? You know, at the moment and over the next few years. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of uh, focus on collectibles, uh, whether it is physical collectible, whether it is digital collectible, or this new thing, the digital collectible. So there seems to be a lot around this, and we think that this is an area to, to, to explore for sure. And there's always some gamific- gamification around this new concept. So uh, mm-hmm. I think those are the areas to explore uh, right now in the present. But in the future, as this is so fast paced, we don't know. We, we, let's, let's imagine in 10 years, what, what will be trending? We, we don't have an idea. We, we, but that's why we need to be always aware. That's why we need to be everywhere, see where are our fans, what are we doing, and think as ourselves, as individuals, because what are we doing? Where, where, are, where are we? Uh, and how are we connecting with games and with things? So, yes, I, I think we need to be aware of these things, but collectibles are a thing for sure. Mm-hmm. Interesting that you mentioned collectibles. And then also, I guess, you know, in the, in the previous question, I think you said, you know, we're open to doing things that are, that are smaller as long as it makes sense for our, for our fans. You know, I think that's the, that's the core element, you know, making sure that it aligns with your identity and that the, the, the fan and community experience is, is um, beneficial. I was going to kind of follow that on and, and ask about, I guess, what we've seen as a trend emerge in, in not only mobile games, but games in general is I, th- I think that whole model has changed that previously, if you're thinking about especially football, it was generally, you know, a football game where, where you know, the licensing would take place or there would be a game built around an IP. Whereas I think over the last couple of years, we've seen the rise of, you know, what in the games industry is called live ops, which are live events in existing games. And, and sometimes they're not even necessarily like thematic fits that you would expect. I think during the, the World Cup uh, last year, I think in Call of Duty Warzone, there was uh, Messi, Pogba, Neymar um, were, were kind of all in there. I think maybe others as well. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts on that because, you know, they're, they're a little harder to assess from a does it fit our identity? It's, you know, it's not something that traditionally would have made sense. And as you, as you just said, you know, we don't know what will make sense in, in 10 years from now, but I think these kind of uh, smaller collaborations where they're uh, tapping into an audience that probably overlaps already with your, with your fans seems like a, like a big opportunity for sporting teams, but it's still kind of largely untapped. It, it seems to be something that stands out uh, when, when it happens. Are you seeing, more of that are you do you think that will continue to be the way that this happens where you will end up taking your your brand and your club into kind of all manner of 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 types of opportunities and experiences that necessarily aren't you know aligned with with football is is that how you think this space will play out i think this space is helping making the transition from a from football just being leisure something that you come to once a week to being lifestyle and a whole experience, Mm -hmm. a constant presence. I think with um, not only Web3, but, you know, gamification and so on in the later years now, um, it's closing the gap in just, you know, a Sunday match that father and son come to either the whole family is coming to because now you perhaps have a female mascot that, you know, appeals to the little girls and it comes up with the whole experience. I think the gamification just allows Mm -hmm. your brand to get out there a lot more. And even like you said, if it doesn't make 
it may seem like it doesn't make sense. You know, Call of Duty, World Cup, it's, it's, two, it's two different worlds a little bit, but you have thousands, mm -hmm. if not millions of people that play Call of Duty and like football. Mm -hmm. So it almost goes back to the thing that I said about our Turkish fans. You can, you can either appeal to the fan that, that's not quite a fan, but has positive, a positive Im image of your club. And that small, what seems like a small partnership just, uh, you know, it makes a tweak and you acquire a new fan. Or you can also have the fan that's already fan. Then now it's like, wow, this is cool. My club, you know, mm -hmm. my club, my colors, this is my brand, you know, we're present everywhere. It's, it makes them proud. So I think essentially gamification, it's, it's helping and facilitating and closing, closing the gap from something that's leisure to making clubs more lifestyle in a way. Yeah, I think that I think that makes sense. And games is, you know, the, the games market of the audience is so big now that I think it really does align with that. I think maybe 20 years ago, you couldn't necessarily use games as a channel to reach a broad market audience. And, and it wouldn't make sense as a as a route for kind of that lifestyle element of the brand. But now that you've got right. billions of players around the world, I think it is it is kind of important to be there if you're going to try and have your brand out there um, in a way that people can kind of attach identity and, and, and kind of personality to it. So no, that, that's really fascinating. I, I think my last follow up question there is, you know, when you do think about um, all those different types of places that you can be in games um, outside of the outside of the, I guess, you know, what do the fans think or are there enough fans here for this to overlap? Are there any ways that you particularly think, you know, you should be thinking about how to take advantage of, of this kind of like spread of opportunities. And then secondly, are there any criteria that make you say, okay, like let's do that, but let's not do that. Like, is it, is it all fan and you know, like, is it just a kind of gut feel and demographic overlap or are there, are there certain kind of criteria you use to, to assess, well, let's go after those ones. I think our main criteria is our identity. Mm -hmm. Does it match the four pillars that we believe in? Does it does it represent us? Mm -hmm. Because when you partner with somebody, that means that you guys have something in common, whether it be your beliefs, how you work, what you've achieved. And so the first criteria really is, does it make sense in terms of who they are and who we are? And a lot of, a lot of the times, if it's, if it's a challenging, if it's a challenging brand, if it's a brand that likes to evolve, if it's a brand that looks at fear with caution but doesn't let it stop them, I think if they're risk takers, they usually match with us. And then it's the the second aspect: will the even if we do go forward with this, will the fans appreciate it? Do you think it's something that betters their lives? Do you think it's something that adds on to, you know, either it could be their everyday routine or it could be the once, once in a while, but does it help them? Does it benefit them in some way? And then you go from there. Then you go from the, either whether it be the business perspective, branding, marketing, and so on. But essentially, I think our main criteria is identity, mm -hmm. who they are, who we are. And then, okay, if we do go forward with this, what about our fans? Because something that we we say a lot of the times here is, without without the fans, clubs are nothing. Regardless mm -hmm. of who you are, what sport it is, if you don't have anybody supporting you, you we're here for them. Essentially, the club has grown, and it's not just about yeah, you go onto the pitch and you win and you become the biggest. Okay, but you have, in our case, it's fifty thousand people that fill up the stadium, you know, that's what, there's 11 players on the pitch. And then we always say, you know, we're the 12th player almost cheering them on. And so we, what we want to do is give back, be present, help them. And like I said, first step identity doesn't make sense for either parties. And then really the limiting line is, mm -hmm. does it make sense for our fans? Yeah. And in, in terms of strategy, because there's all, always a strategy mm -hmm. behind everything. Uh, yes, there's the, the demographic aspect of things. We want to be everywhere for sure, but, but it, it says Barbara mentioned, it, as long as it makes sense, because we have to think about the future. We, we, we have to respect all 
kind of funds that we have, we have to think, okay, what are kids doing right now? How can we be where kids are? If you think of a brand in terms of brand perspective, uh, 30 years ago, you have to limit yourself to billboards or to uh, sponsoring the, the, the jerseys. Now we have the digital space. We have a whole new world where we can explore partnerships, where we can explore collaborations. So, yes, I think it's a natural evolution. Mm -hmm. If you think about cartoons, you see a lot of intercourse between uh, the heroes. They are now in different kinds of cartoons. They're uh, the, the Superman and the Spider-Man. They're always uh, in different kinds of fields and they're, they are also participating in different kinds of broadcasts, in different kinds of networks. So yes, our players are heroes So in terms of a fan perspective. So it makes sense that their heroes are in their games as well. So this mix, mi mishmash thing, it, it makes sense, yeah. Uh, makes some sense to, to um, be across multiple kind of areas in gaming. I think you've got, you know, I think Barbara, you mentioned, you know, identity and then caring about fans are the two kind of main pillars that you assess things on. And, and then you've kind of got the ability to then segment that out into, you've got fans that are older that have loved you know, the, the club for so long and they'll be playing certain games. But then I think football is such a lifelong passion that if you if you don't, you know, think about where are the kids right now that might like the club, like if you don't, if you're not there, it's very hard to get them later. So if you can be in front of them now, that makes a lot of sense as well. So thinking about like all the types of fans and all the places they might be, I think is a, a re really strong learning to, to kind of take into, into thinking about the games market. Absolutely. And it's starting earlier and earlier on mm -hmm. now. You know, you know, you go out to dinner, you go to a restaurant and there's a three year old already with a with the phone in front of them. So it's the early bird gets the worm and we want to be that early bird as long as it makes sense for us. Yeah, yeah. And and, and yes, if if you think this is also a, a generation gap, so our grandparents grew up without technology or with little technology. Our parents grew up having contact with computers as a, an adult, right? So we grew up with technology as kids, but mostly as teenagers. My kids are growing up with technology right now. And, and, we have to understand how do we want to relate with that kind of space? How do we want to be there? And how can we add value to this? Because it's important to add value to, to this mm -hmm. space as well. I, I, th I think um, what you're trying to say is, and this might be the inside scoop for our audience, is that there's a FC Porto Roblox experience coming. <laughs> <laughs> no no but I, I think um it may, makes so much sense right like when i was a kid and i love sport like the only touch point that you got to the club like how you chose your club for your sport was like your parents you put it on tv and you just like you see the players and you're like i like this club for whatever reason you know your dad sits down and watch the game with you and you know that's now my right. team now it's like, you know, I feel like there is this huge opportunity for, for sporting teams is like there's this new medium, which is games. And, you know, like you said, Barbara, like there's kids, you know, as young as three on the iPad at the restaurant. Right. And like that's, you know, the, that's how you're, you you can reach these fans is, is through this new medium. So um, like as the the this form of entertainment games becomes the biggest form of entertainment like do you just continue to see more and more clubs you know again i'm going to use some flattery here i know you're the the innovators in the space but do you see more and more clubs start to follow you and and start to tap into this medium as a way of reaching new fans yeah there was there was a, a club not club but so a squad that we noticed we would sign a partnership and then months after they sign a partnership 
And then we'd sign a partnership and then months after, and we kind of started looking at each other like, okay, we knew we were the first one, but it's different for you to be the first one than for you to be a trendsetter. And so it was quite cool for us, you know, we're small in terms of population. We're a small country. We're a, you know, we're a club that comes from the second biggest city, populated city in Portugal. And it was quite cool for us to see like, okay, we're physically small, but we're so big in terms of our presence. This is what's happening. And we've noticed also, which is, which is funny for us to see in terms of the generational concept that you mentioned. Now, now, you know, years, years ago, you'd have family teams. So whatever the dad, the uncle, the whatever was, and the kids would be, now it's not, now you see a lot more kids and parents, you know, arguing about, you know, who's the best and who, because again, from, from such a young age, you're exposed to different teams and they, they have more educational content in terms of who's winning, who's doing what, what players are big and what players are, you know, the stars. And, and so it's very interesting and gamification is, is doing that. I do think, however, that gamification, this whole world will be successful if it does not lose completely the physical aspect. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. totally agree. But totally I agree. think that would give the, I think that's, you, you know, you have the first steps, which so before it used to be once a week, you'd go to, you come to the game with friends, family, whatever else, and that was it. Then it turns into the lifestyle. So now the brand is, it's there, it's in your life, you see it, you can either relate to it more or so on. Then now it's into the digital world. And what we see with that digital world is you get the value in the digital if you have the physical. Yeah. Whether it be like in Metaverse, if you have legit and you get a signed jersey, you get VIP tickets, you get to come to the games. It's it's a lot of the new trends that we're, that we're seeing. I, we don't think because like Rashid had mentioned before, it's such a lifelong passion mm. and it's something that's so present. And in so many ways, a lot of people feel represented by their clubs that it will only have, it will only reach its maximum potential if it does not fully lose its physical aspect. Yes, 90% can be online, iPad, whatever form whatever form of, um, of hardware it may be, as long as it doesn't lose the physical, as long as it doesn't lose that you cheering for your team, them scoring, you getting the goosebump mm-hmm. feel. That will be the only thing I think that will carry this on further. Yeah, and, and the thing is, I think, I think we all agree on this. It's digital and physical are not competing. They are they are partners, right? So, and this new space, this new partnership between physical world and digital world, this is where things are going to, 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 to thrive, right? This is where things are going to, to grow. It's not moving everything to the digital area. It's understanding how to build bridges between mm-hmm. those two worlds. Because, yeah, that's totally agree, Barbara. Well done. <laughs> I, I, no, it's 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 actually like a fantastic point because mm-hmm. me as a as a big sports fan, even if I think about an NFT, would I be interested in buying a collectible from one of my favorite teams? Sure, but there isn't anything that really replaces the feeling of like buying a player's jersey and having that sense of pride in your club or you know going to Some a phys- like history with you. Exactly. Right. Like, and, and, you know, I look back at some of the jerseys in my cupboard and I'm like, oh man, that was either the dumbest thing I ever bought or, <laughs> you know, I'm so proud that I supported that club at that moment. Cause you know, what, what an awesome right. player that, that person turned out to be. So um, you're absolutely right. Um, one, one last thing um, I think about like the, the generational thing, it's a bit of a curveball. Um, I think about my nephew who plays a lot of, um, a lot of soccer games, or sorry, football, um, football games, um, and they're like fantasy games where you basically create a team that's just made up of individual players, mm-hmm. right? And do you feel that there's some risk there of like kind of, you know, might there be a lack of brand loyalty where if, you know, someone grows up liking 
he loves Neymar, right? He doesn't like Messi. You know, wherever Neymar goes, he's probably going to become a fan of that team. Do you see like do you see that as a challenge? And I guess like as a club, how do you kind of deal with that and 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 kind of make sure that you you keep that fan? That's interesting you mentioned that because I think we're going through it right now. We have a striker, Taremi. He's from Iran. And we once we signed him, we saw our followers shoot up. Followers, um, engagement, social media comments, whatever it may be. Now, the question is, once he leaves, what will happen to those fans? Will they follow him? How do we keep them? And I think that if your strategy is well aligned, I think you can, you'll able you'll be able to keep them, because it's it's it works hand in hand. So you might have a club that can help you become more loyal to a player, which you've seen happen previously. You can have a player that you might not have such a positive, you know, view of him, and then he signs for a club that you might have you know some kind of empathy and that helps and it can be vice vice versa i think it, it's almost like a, a a give and a take to be honest it can happen it can um you can keep those fans they can have some part even though they might be completely loyal to the player itself but have you know a small so have empathy for you um follow, want to follow up and still be interested in whatever it may be it can be both. You can have the risk of that player leaves and that player goes to another team and okay, that's it. That's I'm just following him. It's you, you you'll try to do the best you can in terms of respecting of respecting their interests, respecting really what you think will attract them and keeping trying to keep that connection alive. I'm sure that once this player leaves hopefully years and years from now um once he leaves you can you'll be able to keep most because you know we have a very good relationship with that player and it was a player that even though there were a lot of cultural differences you know from countries and even the club mm -hmm. itself um very well integrated awesome person in general very, very, very nice. And I think that also has a, a big impact. It's a risk that you can take. You just have to try to grow it. Mm -hmm. Just try to feed it and try to and try to grow it as best as you can and then hope for the best. Yeah. And in, in terms of legal gray areas, it's it's all about the way you connect with players, mm -hmm. right? So we as Barbara mentioned, we have we have an ecosystem here that, that thrives a family feeling and belonging. So we have that between us, but between us and our players, if you think about almost of our players that have left here, they they stay connected with us for forever. Mm -hmm. So our legends are really connected mm -hmm. to us. And this is about philosophy. This is about identity as well. If, if you think about uh, we're, we're growing in a more individual society and there are a lot of people that say, oh, okay, I go to work not to make friends but to become successful, right? Here we don't have that because I think that the, the best work that we do it's the work when, when we do together. Uh, we work in different areas, but we cooperate and then the work becomes bigger than us. And the club is this, the club is bigger than us. And the, 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 the space that the club is creating and the relationship between the club and the player, it's key to overcome those gray areas and those indefinitions in terms of Co collaborations in terms of funds, in terms of that gray space. So uh, this is this is why FC Porto is so special, and this is why we're so proud of working here. It's 
well, I grew up hoping to play for FC Porto. Then I understood. Now it. you sit behind the computer. Yeah. <laughs> that works out. But it's much better, even for the club, because yeah. I'm not that good player. So, yes, I, I, I found a different way to, to cooperate, and that, that's it. That there's always space for everyone to cooperate, for the fans mm. to be fans, for us to be workers, for the players to be players. But the club, it's all that and beyond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's yeah, a really... You, you're always, you'll, you'll always be the 12th man. No, no. It's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if the coach asks, I'm ready. You're ready, you're ready. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a really beautiful sentiment to um, to try and wrap things up on. I think, you know, even the word club, right? It's like a... I don't know the proper definition, but, it you know, it's... Uh, there's so many relationships that make the whole thing come together. It's nothing without players. It's nothing without fans. It's nothing without the teams making it all happen. So everything that you're doing in this space seems to be uh, a way to enrich and engage the the whole community, um, regardless of, of who they are. So um, it's been really, really interesting hearing about how you're doing it. And um, sounds like uh, from from what Barbara said, there's, uh, there's a few people following in your footsteps and imitation is the highest uh, form of flattery. So... For any licenses out there that want to know what to do next, just just watch what FC Porto does. You don't have to come up with anything original. You can just follow along and, and they'll get it right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, and we're always we're, we we always have open doors to hear everyone's project mm -hmm. as well. So yeah. every 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 person that has an idea, it has a, an open door here mm -hmm. to expose the idea and we can grow together ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks, thanks for coming on, guys. I, I really um, look forward to to seeing um, what comes next, um, and we'll see you up in Porto for a, a Francesina very soon. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope so. Thank you guys for having us. Yeah, on. thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks. See you soon. Okay. Thanks for watching the Licensing and Games video series. For more content like this, subscribe to our channel or check us out at LayerLicensing.com.